Hello, I'm Mickey Pistorius, author, profiler, and psychologist. The fourth episode of the television series Catch Me a Killer depicts the case and the investigation of Moses Sitoli, the Atwichville serial killer. I remember us weekly finding bodies scattered on the felt of on the outskirts of Atwichville and the total disregard for any human dignity. To me, what was particularly sad was the body of a little boy found close to his mother and he had died of exposure. I could just imagine that little boy sitting there for hours next to the dead body of his mother crying and nobody came. And eventually, as her body began decomposing and attracting rats, he must have crawled away where he was still crying until eventually a day or so later he died of thirst or hunger. The agony of those crime scenes now lie buried between the houses that have been built over the crime scenes in Atwichville. Atwichville was established in 1939 when South Africa was still a union and that is a dominion of the British Empire and it was ruled by a governor general who represented the British monarch. So it was established about nine years before the election of the apartheid government in 1948. It was named after Mrs. Attridge, who was a philanthropist and she was a, a black sash activist and she was the deputy mayoress of Pretoria. And she endeavored to improve the living conditions of black people that at that stage lived in Marabastat, which was a shanty town in Pretoria. Atridgeville provided amenities such as brick housing and lighting, electricity and toilets, and there was even a train that took the people to the Pretoria CBD so they could so that they could work there. Our first record of an Atridgeville serial killer was called Elias Zitavutsi because Moses Sitoli was unfortunately not the only one to claim the title of an Atridgeville serial killer. Now, Elias um, Zitavutsi hacked 16 women to death in the 1950s, and we suspect this was racially motivated because they were all white women, and he was apprehended when he sold the item that belonged to one of the women, and he was then hanged in November 1960. Atridgeville was the playground of serial killers and there were two unidentified serial killers. The one was also in the 1950s when the bodies of six boys were found and they were, they were mutilated um, within a period of five months. And then later in the 1970s there was a person called the Iron Man of Atridgeville and he bashed seven people to death as they were walking from the Shabines, which is the local pubs in Attridgeville, on their way home. These murders, both unidentified, ended as abruptly as they had started. And then, from 1974 to 1978, 19 pubescent girls were found slaughtered. So in a period of four years, these this investigation was completely derailed by the peculiarity of the suspect, who was called John Harvey. Now, John Harvey was a policeman that worked in the mortuary. And what he did is his peculiarity um, eventually was, it was a paraphilia, but it presented as muti. Now, for centuries, Africa and South Africa has been scourged by Muti murders. And Muti is powerful medicine made from harvested body parts used by witch doctors to cure illnesses and to ward off evil and bad luck. Sometimes the witch doctors would harvest these body parts themselves or they would buy it from people who harvest the body parts and sell them for profit. Muti is more potent if it is harvested from a victim while they are still alive. Now, witch doctors are not traditional healers. 
there is a distinct dif uh, a differentiation between them. Traditional healers do not use body parts, and I will discuss this more in full in one of my later videos. So John Harvey one day had to dissect the body of a young, pretty young girl. And as he was making an incision into her throat, he experienced an unexpected arousal. Now, John had been impotent for many years, so he just didn't expect this. Um, a paraphilia. A paraphilia develops when a certain stimulus, and in this case, cutting the girl's throat, causes a pleasant physical reaction, the arousal. And this leads a person to search for similar stimuli to re-experience this pleasant reaction. And the more the process is repeated, the more fixed the fixation becomes until it eventually overrides any other arousal stimuli. It is one of the most potent reward systems for a human being. And John's fixation boded ill for many of the young girls of Atridgeville. So John was dishonorably discharged in 1972, and we do not know the reasons. As I've often explained, when serial killers experience some kind of disappointment that makes them feel inferior, in order to restore the homeostasis of their psyche, they kill because that makes them feel um, omnipotent. There is no greater power than having the power of somebody's life literally in your hand. It makes them feel godly. So a year after he was discharged in 1973 in Attridgeville, the bodies of little Magrita and little Patricia Holiot were found with their throats, throats slit. And then in 1974 as well in Attridgeville, three, a seven-year-old Helen Ramskin body was found with her throat cut. In 1975, um, he moved to Louis Trichard, which is about 400 kilometers north of Atridgeville. And there a young called, girl called Mavis Masekwaneng um, was, was walking in the street and her friends were playing in a playground and they saw a man following her. They didn't pay this much attention until a little while later, Mavis came running to them, clutching her throat, which has been slashed. And she lived but she was bleeding and they covered her in a blanket and they took her to a police station where unfortunately she died. That happened in March 1975. In April 1975 in Attridgeville, a little girl called Oma and her friend was playing in a playground and a man approached and he offered Oma money to buy him some cigarettes and the friend saw him following Oma to the cafe to buy the cigarettes. And the next day, her body was found in a dam in, in Atridgeville. So by now, his tally was two victims in 1973, um, one victim in 1974, two victims in 1975, and two victims in 1976. And these were known victims. There could have been more victims. And then in 1977, his tally escalated to five victims. In April 1977, he again moved to Louis Trichard and quite close to the playground where he had previously um, attracted Mavis, there was um, a little girl called Rosina Magnetka and she survived and she told the police that the man dragged her into the felt and he sat on top of her and he cut her throat with a piece of sharpened corrugated iron. So now the police knew what the murder weapon was. And then in May 1977, in Atridgeville, um, a man was walking his dog near the Kalafong Hospital. And there he came upon the body of seven-year-old Gemma, and her throat was slit. But also, there was flesh missing from her leg, which could point to Muti, but it could also point to cannibalism. So the... as later, in our investigation in Mitchell's plane with the station strangler, and the community was in uproar, in, that was in 1994. In 1997, the community of Attridgeville was also in uproar because their children were being slaughtered. And since body parts were missing, the logical conclusion was that these were Muti murders. These children were not raped or, or molested. So, as in the case later of, of Mitchell's plane, the Attridgeville community turned about on itself. And um, pandemonium 
reigned and broke loose as they attacked and stormed the houses of the traditional healers. And there was paranoia because the traditional healers feared for their lives and the community feared from, from retribution and spells by witch doctors. So in 1997, amidst this chaos, little Lekhoa also, um, Zondi, she told her aunt that she wanted to visit her, the house of her mother. And a few days later, when her mother arrived at the aunt's house, they realized that this little girl was missing. Okay. So um, a man that was tending to his sheep, his flock of sheep near the Kalafam hospital, found the body of this little girl. And again, her throat was cut and flesh was missing from her leg. Um, and then the next day after her body was found, the body of 10-year-old little Eva was found and um, she was alive and she told the detectives that the man had cut her throat, he sat on her and cut her throat and when she regained consciousness a piece of flesh of her leg was removed and she managed to crawl to one of the houses which happened to be a house of one of her teachers and she was taken to hospital. Um, unfortunately, um, um, well fortunately she, she, just, um, she recovered and she could identify this man much later. Um, so then, because she survived, he moved again, and this time not as far as Louis Trichard, but just to the east of Pretoria, to Mamelodi, where Atrichville was in the west. And in October 1977, there was the seven-year-old body of, of Gloria, a little girl, and she was found, and her throat was cut, and her larynx and her um, tongue was removed as well. So vigilantism had escalated by now to such an extent that the Pretoria murder and robbery brought in a very powerful Shangoma called Mpapan to assist them in this investigation. Now, ironically, John Harvey's mother was also a Shangoma, so he must have heard from her about this powerful man that had been brought in. And for a period of eight months, there was a cooling off time and there were no murders. And then again, in 1978, the urge to kill returned with vengeance, as there were seven victims in this year. One of the victims survived and she could describe the car. The next victim was eight-year-old Jenny, and she found with her throat cut, her leg was, um, the flesh was missing, uh, but there was also missing flesh from her forehead, and her nose was missing, her tongue was cut out, and strangely enough, her toes were also removed. And she lived in Kudu Street in Atridgeville. And it was later re revealed that John Harvey also lived in Kudu Street in Atridgeville. Um, and then another powerful and senior Sangoma called um, Sarah, uh, her name was Sarah Masciani, um, and she was called in and she pledged the cooperation of all the traditional healers in the region to work with the police. And this must have spooked John, because then he moved and a victim was found in Harankua, which was north of Atridgeville, and another victim was found in, um, in Alexandria, which was south of Atridgeville, and then he moved to Shoshekhu, which was close to Louis Trichard, a few hundred kilometers away from Atridgeville. So on the 26th of November in, 19, um, in 1978, um, a little girl called um, Martha Muthiba went to the shop and she was seen getting into the car with a man. When she didn't return home, her father instigated a search party for her. And they found a little boy who said he saw her got into the car and he described the car. And the search party found the car with John inside it and they severely assaulted him. And then they took him to the police station. And at the police station, he said he would take them to the felt where they would find Mavis. As they were walking into the felt, he said he wanted to urinate and he walked a little way off. And one of the policemen noticed that he dropped something from his pocket. And he was grinding it with his heel into the ground and that it was a windpipe. And then he showed them the body of little Mavis and her father took off his shirt and he covered his daughter's body with his shirt and he prayed for her. And then um, he was taken to the murder and robbery unit where he was interrogated by Captain Santi Fenter. 
And then he told Sampi Fenta that he did not harvest the parts for Muti. He harvested them because for his own paraphilia and he used this as a trophy um, and in his self-stimulation. So um, I will speak about trophies again in, an, in another video later. Um, so eventually he was sent to Vest Copies and he was found psychiatric hospital and he was found fit to stand trial and he was hanged on the 2nd of February in 1980, found guilty by Judge Schreider. Now, eight years later, between 89 and, eight, and, um, eight, and between 88 and 89, there was called Johannes Opa Masciani and he was dubbed the Beast of Atridgeville because he sodomized and stoned to death eight boys. Now, two of these little boys survived. And they explained to the, to the detective called Captain Jan Kuchlenberg that this man had a droopy eye and he had a tattoo of a dagger and a cross on his left arm. So the police at least had a description of him. And then in, in July, um, a man jumped in front of a car in Marabastadt. And the next day at the morgue, the police identified this as the body of Opa Johannes Masciani, the beast of Atrichburg. And it was then revealed that he actually started killing the boys a day after he was released from prison for killing his girlfriend. So after John Harvey was apprehended and hanged, it seemed like the little girls of Attridgeville were safe again to play in the streets of Attridgeville. However, years later, in their 20s, in the early 1990s, around about 1994, they stood the chance of becoming the victims of Moses Sitoli, an Attridgeville serial killer, whom we investigated. And Moses was apprehended in November 1995, and he was eventually convicted of 38 murders and 40 rapes and sentenced to 2,410 years. And one wonders if some of those little girls later became his victims. And I hope Moses Sitoli is the last at the Atridgeville serial killers. If you like these videos, you're interested in them, please give us your thumbs up, please share them and subscribe to my channel, Mickey Pistorius, Profiler on Record, and you will get weekly videos. Thank you.